piece, and I've been there for uh, about uh, over 16 years now. And in the course of that, in the last few years, I've worked with Mauricio a little bit, uh, and it is a great pleasure to welcome him back to Mary Queen of Peace. So let me just uh, read a few words about uh, his background and his accomplishments. So Mauricio is a journalist who graduated with honors magna cum laude at the Pontifical Gregorian University in Rome. He holds a diploma in Pauline theology at the Pontifical Catholic University of Chile. He pursued the BA in sacred scripture at the Institute of Sacred Scripture in Mexico and a BS in computer engineering at the Monterey Institute of Technology. His program, Semillas para la Vida, Seeds for the Life, um, has been on the air for 12 years in more than 25 radio stations in 10 countries. He conducts the program in Spanish on biblical exegesis, Passion for the Gospel Every Week, columnist for Northwest Catholic Magazine. His column, uh, Seeds of the Word, has been awarded among the best three spirituality columns in Spanish by the Catholic Press Association uh, of the US and Canada. He is the author of several books, including two bestsellers. His books in English include At the Foot of the Cross, Our Family at the Foot of the Cross, and Listen, It is Jesus Speaking from the Cross. He has been married for over 20 years. He is the father of two sons, and he is celebrating over 30 years of apostolic work in Mexico and the U.S. with a focus on faith formation. And Mauricio is a parishioner at St. Monica's Parish from where he's visiting us today. So it is it is my great pleasure to, to welcome Mauricio again back to our parish, Mary Queen of Peace. So welcome, and thank you so much for being here. Thank you, Sultan, and thank you, Monica, for the invitation. It is a great pleasure to be back, uh, to be back through Zoom this time. It is almost the same as to be back live, right? Because nowadays we are so used to communicating just as the Jetsons did that, well, the future is here and we are part of it. <laughs> so it is good to have these means of communication that allow us to continue growing in our faith and, and, and that help us to continue evangelizing. And uh, this is a big moment because it is the year of St. Joseph. And uh, Pope Francis gave us a tremendous gift to all Catholics because one of the things is that Joseph is very important, really, really important in our life as a church. Uh, but the fact is that we know little about him and we tend to not focus on him too much. And uh, part of the reasons is because the scripture itself doesn't tell us much about Joseph. So uh, developing a devotion to St. Joseph is not as common as developing a devotion to the most of the saints. So having this opportunity to, to know more about Joseph definitely will help us to understand our faith better and will help us also to approach Jesus in a unique way. If we learn from him. And the purpose of this talk tonight is precisely to get us closer, to get us more familiar to Joseph and to learn about his dreams. And that is the reason why the title of this talk is the four dreams of Joseph. You know that the gospel tells us so little about Joseph, but at the same time, it tells us a lot. And we will discover today how much it actually tells us about him. But, you know, page to page, and if we count the different episodes in where we find him, it is still very little. And for that reason, there is a tendency of reflecting on the silence of Joseph. And uh, I bet you that many times through this year of St. Joseph, you will find many readings, many spiritual readings, and probably you will have some other guest speaker who will talk or preach about the silence of Joseph. Joseph has become a sort of a silent saint. The, and that can be very beneficial for sure. And that's why through centuries, the church has reflected a lot on, on that silent Joseph and his silence. The problem with it is that by reflecting on what Joseph never said, there is no other way to do so but by means of speculation. And uh, when we speculate, we can be right or we can be wrong. So what we're going to do tonight is to, to reflect about what we know about Joseph through the gospel. Specifically the gospel according to Matthew, because he's the one who tells us the most about Joseph. This all started, this adventure of mine started, well, first of all, when the Pope uh, 
proclaimed this year of Joseph uh, through my radio program and through the years. Uh, it is actually a bit outdated, that presentation, probably from the first time I spoke at Mary Queen of Peace, because now my program has, has been on the air for 15 years. And every time the Pope calls a holy year, uh, I immediately give uh, special attention to that, and I have a weekly program dedicated to whatever jubilee we are celebrating in the church. This time, the, the dreams of, uh, I mean, this time, the year of St. Joseph. Uh, and here in Seattle, locally, something that I am doing in Spanish in collaboration with the, with the Hispanic ministry is that every Thursday I am producing a three-minute video that is called Seeds of the Eucharist. And uh, the, the purpose of that program is to talk in three minutes about all the theology and about all the catechesis about the Eucharist and about the liturgy. And I will continue doing that through the year. And also, if you read my column in Northwest, uh, in Northwest Catholic, you will see that through the year, I am focusing ex exclusively on the year of the Eucharist that we are celebrating here in the Archdiocese. So for that reason, in my program in Spanish, I am every Wednesday talking about Joseph. And uh, when a friend invited me to, to talk to Monica because of her group that was, or that is getting prepared to consecrate themselves to, to St. Joseph in Spanish, uh, this was quite an opportunity for me to approach Joseph for the first time in my life from a biblical standpoint, because honestly, I had never done so. So it was fascinating, the idea to give a lecture on Joseph. The problem is that I knew very little about him. But doing the, going through the exercise of analyzing these biblical texts, I, I learned so much that is so beautiful, as you will see, that was worth sharing not only in Spanish, but also in English. And that's how somehow Monica arranged this talk. And now here I am sharing this with you. And I hope this won't be the last time I share this talk, either in Spanish or in English, through the year, because it is a very important opportunity to, to continue sharing and to continue learning about Joseph. So we will talk about the four dreams of Joseph, and we will do so uh, from a biblical standpoint. So this is a biblical analysis. It will be interesting to analyze these texts. Now, the thing is that what we are analyzing is sacred scripture, and sacred scripture is not to be studied. It is to be listened to because it is actually the word of the Lord. It is God talking to us through this scripture. So we have to analyze it to understand it better, but the purpose is not to understand it. To, the purpose is to, to listen to whatever God wants to tell us through those words. And uh, so this biblical analysis will not end in an analysis itself, but what we are going to do is also to reflect on the different findings we, uh, we get to know. This is how my three books in English look like. Uh, you can get them in Kindle, you can get them in paperback edition, they are available in Amazon. If you have a subscription to Kindle Unlimited, you can even read them for free. And uh, this is a good season to read any of those or the three of them because, uh, you know, this is Lent. And these three books that I have written in English happen to be related to Lent and uh, more specifically to Holy Week. Our family at the foot of the cross is a book that constantly people tell me that it is the best book on the family they have ever read. And the reason for that is that because all of our families have to carry a cross and not only one, we have to carry many, many crosses. And the reality is that crosses are painful and uh, it is not easy to carry a cross. And many times we are afraid of carrying the cross and many times we feel ashamed of carrying the cross. If it was not painful, it wouldn't be a cross. It is not easy, it is not pleasing to carry a cross. And the, most of the times the cross we carry doesn't make any sense at all unless we bind our cross to the cross of Jesus. So when we step with our family at the foot of the cross, it's when everything begins to make sense. And in this book, I touch on all the different crosses we have to carry to our family life. And uh, no matter how many times people read this book, every time they will find a different cross in one of the pages and then everything will make sense. So. Uh, this is something that I really encourage you to, to read because the, the feedback I have received is, is consistent through the time and people tell me that they, they have received a lot, especially with our family at the foot of the cross. Uh, but the other two, of course, are very good readings as well. Now let's get into the subject. When I started approaching these texts or these texts, 
I have to pick one method of exegesis. The exegesis, exegesis is the branch of theology that focuses on the interpretation of biblical texts. So I have to pick one of the methods in order to, to get the most out of it. And because of the characteristics of the texts, I decided to apply the narrative analysis. So what I did was that I took each of the narrations of the four dreams and analyze the narration with the purpose of identifying the structure in which each of them was composed. Because once we identify the structure of a given text, then it becomes easier to understand what the sacred author wants to communicate. Because it is a fact that the gospels contain the, word of, the words of Jesus, the teachings of Jesus, uh, the life of Jesus, but they are presented through the lens of the evangelist who also has a specific purpose when he's writing his book. For a start, each of the different evangelists had a different audience in mind, and that audience had a different religious background, so they had to catechize them according to their background. And with that purpose, they compose the different texts and, and the different episodes of the life of Jesus and the different sayings and teachings of Jesus in a way that will help their purpose of catechizing those communities. In this case, because we're going to focus on the gospel according to Matthew, we have to bear in mind that he wrote to Christians who came from the Jewish world. So they had, according to their religious background, the expectation of a Messiah. And uh, Matthew wants to convince them and to reassure them that Jesus, who is the, the star of his writing, is the true Messiah. And that's the way he writes, in order to convince him. And for that reason, he tends to prove how the prophecies of the Old Testament are fulfilled in Jesus once and again, once and again. Let's begin with uh, this piece of the infancy narrative according to Matthew. Let's remember that the four Gospels contain two infancy narratives, one according to Matthew, the other one according to Luke. And uh, they are different because they come from different sources. When they, you know, when the Gospels uh, began to be written, the focus, the original focus was uh, Easter, the death and the resurrection of Jesus. And not only the Gospels, that was the, the first catechetical teaching of the apostles. They focused on that. That was the latest happening and it was the most relevant. So that's where, that's where they focused their attention on. But then later on, they added all the teachings of Jesus and also they included in their, in their Gospels as much as they knew and learned and found about the life of Jesus. And uh, digging into the past, it came to a point in which the, one of the topics of interest was the origins of Jesus, where he was born, who was his family, where did he live, how did he grow, etc. So that research led them to find about the infancy of Jesus, and that's how Matthew and Luke added at the end of the Gospels, what happens to be the beginning of them, which is the infancy narratives. In the case of Luke, he is focused on Mary, whereas Matthew is focused on Joseph. And that's why we know the most about Joseph from the Gospel according to Matthew, and specifically from his infancy narrative. It begins like this. When his mother Mary was betrothed to Joseph, but before they lived together, she was found with a child through the Holy Spirit. Joseph, her husband, since he was a righteous man, yet unwilling to expose her to shame, decided to divorce her quietly. Such was his intention when, behold, the angel of the Lord appeared to him in a dream and said, Joseph, son of David, do not be afraid to take Mary, your wife, into your home, for it is through the Holy Spirit that this child has been conceived in her. One of the challenges here is that we have only an hour to talk because we could dissect just this pericope word by word and there could be a lot, a lot, a lot that we could uh, learn. Just the fact that, that Joseph was a righteous man. If we read in the Bible all the descriptions about what a righteous man is, we can learn a lot about Joseph just with that single word. So this, uh, what I'm covering this time is uh, 
like an introduction, like a biblical introduction to the to, to all the exegesis that we can develop from these gospels. So anyway, so this is the beginning. And remember that back then in that culture, a couple was betrothed and they didn't live together after a year. So for that reason, during that period of time, they couldn't have any child. And uh, all of a sudden, Joseph learns because Mary tells him that she is expecting a child and Joseph knows he is not the father. So what a shocking moment for Joseph for sure, right? And uh, we cannot imagine all the feelings that went through his heart when he knew that Mary, his beloved Mary, was expecting a child and he was not the father. So back then, uh, the people of God was allowed by Moses to divorce. So that is something that Jesus corrected later on, right? You, you remember that uh, in one of his Midrashim, his interpretations of the law, uh, he said, you have heard that it is written that you can divorce uh, your wife, but now I tell you that whatever God has bound, no man can, can separate, right? But at this time, it was possible to do so. The problem is that Mary was going to be uh, divorced by Joseph because she was pregnant and the baby was not Joseph's. So that would be adultery, a reason, a valid reason and a legal reason for a divorce. The biggest problem is that adultery was penalized with lapidation, which means Mary would have to die being stoned by all the people. And according to the law, the first one to throw, to cast a stone on her would be the one who accused her. So it would have to be Joseph, the first one to cast a stone on Mary, and then the rest of the village would continue until they killed her. And regardless of the big disenchantment Joseph might have felt when he learned about this, he still loved Mary so much that he decided to divorce her in secret, so nobody knew in order to protect her. So regardless of what had happened, because he still didn't know exactly what happened, this is, a, this is a big sign of how much Joseph loved Mary. And then we see the first dream. Such was his intention when, behold, the angel of the Lord appeared to him in a dream and said, Joseph, son of David, do not be afraid to take Mary, your wife, into your home. For it is through the Holy Spirit that this child has been conceived in her. She will bear a son, and you are to name him Jesus, because he will save his people from their sins. So this is the first dream. And what I did was to begin dissecting this text. Uh, remember that, that the first thing I tried to do was to identify if it was composed using a specific structure. I didn't find any specific structure here. So then my next step was to go word by word to see what I could find. And one of the things is that this gospel that you have in front of your eyes is written in English. It is actually a translation. And when I was developing this interpretation first, I was using a text in Spanish. There is one complication when we interpret a passage of the Bible in a different language from the one it was written in. And the challenge is that, uh, as the Italians say, traduttore, traditore. A translator is a traitor because it is so easy to betray the real words and the real ideas of the author when you make a translation, because translating from one language to another depends on the richness of a given language. And it is not always easy because there are languages that has a plethora of synonyms to say one thing. And even though all the synonyms mean the same, depending on which one you use, you give a different emphasis or people understand it in a different way. And there are some other languages that are limited in that, in that sense. So you lose the richness or you lose the flavor. That is something that I struggle with month after month when I translate my column for Northwest Catholic because I write it in Spanish and then I translate it to English. And many times I lose what I want. Well, you know, the ideas are exactly the same but when I write in Spanish, in some occasions, I tend, I, I tend to write using a bit of poetry so that even the words I use rhyme in a way to give some rhythm to my sentences. And when I translate that, that to English, then that metric and that rhythm and that rhyme is completely lost. And then that flavor is lost, even though the, the, the message is exactly the same. 
So what I do is that I go to the original of the gospel, which is written in Greek. And then I found the first surprise here. Uh, and I'm going to show this just as an example, because I'm not going to do that for, for the entire, uh, for dreams, because this is not a class in Greek and because we don't have the time, but I will show you this one only just to see what I found. First, we find a reference here. It says, the angel of the Lord appeared to him in a dream. The angel of the Lord. Such was his intention when behold, the angel of the Lord appeared to him. So when I read the gospel in Greek, I found that it said, Tauta de autu, entimitentos idu, angelos kirio. And here was the first surprise. The text in Greek says, angelos kirio. The text in English says, the angel of the Lord. Well, the thing is that if in Greek it said, the angel of the Lord, then it would have said, to angelos kirio. But the text in the gospel doesn't say to angelos kirio. It simply says angelos kirio. So it doesn't say the angel of the Lord. What it says is just angel of the Lord. So the, the correct way actually to read this would be such was his intention when behold, angel of the Lord appeared to him in a dream. Now, when you do that in English, it won't make sense, right? But when you do this in Greek, as Luke was, as, as Matthew was doing, then what we realize is that angel of the Lord is not being used as a noun, but rather it is used as a name. That is the name. And there's a big difference between the angel of the Lord and just angel of the Lord. Why? Because in, the, in, in sacred scripture, if, you go, if we go to the Old Testament, we will find different references to the angel of the Lord. And the angel of the Lord in the Old Testament, is not an angel. Angels, of course, exist. But when in, in, in the Old Testament we find a reference to the angel of the Lord, it is not an angel. It is the angelic representation of God. And we see this consistently in many passages. Think of Hagar, for instance, the mother of Ishmael, when they are wandering in the desert and the angel of the Lord protects them. Or think of Abraham when he is going to kill his son Isaac and then the angel of the Lord comes and stops him. Or, or think in the book of Judges, think of Gideon. Uh, he was also uh, protected by the angel of the Lord. When he was sent by the angel of the Lord precisely to rescue the people of God from the Midianites. So that angel of the Lord, when it is called the angel of the Lord in the Old Testament, it is not an angel. It is the angelic form of God himself. But here... In Greek, we don't find the angel of the, word, of the Lord. We only find angel of the Lord. So it is a name, which means it is a specific angel. Thanks to Luke, we know that this angel is actually an archangel, and it happens to be Gabriel, the archangel. So that's the one. So it is not God represented as an angel. It is an angel, and specifically, it is Gabriel, the archangel. But you can see how, how fascinating it can be to, to go that, that deep and to find these subtleties that can mean a lot. Let's continue. So he appeared to him in a dream and said, Joseph, son of, son of David. Well, see, we have to go word by word because that's the way to, to discover all the treasure behind this text. Joseph, son of David. The way the gospel according to Matthew begins is with the gene genealogy of Jesus. What Matthew does is to write uh, the genealogy of Jesus separated in three groups of 14 generations, which add up 42 generations. See the way he ends this, this presentation. And by the way, this is the reason why Matthew is represented as a man, as a winged man. You have seen these, these four apocalyptic, uh, apocalyptic images that are used to represent the four Gospels or the four evangelists, right? A winged man represents Matthew, and they are, and they are used uh, based on how each of the Gospels begin. So in the case of Matthew, because he begins with a genealogy, he is represented with a winged man that appears in the book of Revelation. Then, in the case of Luke, because his Gospel begins in the Temple of Jerusalem with the Annunciation to Zechariah, then he's represented by the winged oxen that appears in the gospel. Because oxen were, you know, they were, they were offered in sacrifice, in holocaust, in the, in the temple of Jerusalem. 
In the case of the gospel according to Mark, because it begins in the wilderness, then he's represented with the winged lion. And in the case of the gospel of John, because he flies so high the way he begins, in the beginning there was the Logos, and the Logos was with God, and the Logos was God. Well, that's why he is represented with the eagle. But we can see here in this case uh, the, the, gene the genealogy that, that is uh, presented by Matthew. Luke also presents a genealogy of Jesus, and he presents it in, in reverse. It begins with Jesus, and it actually goes all the way through Adam. In the case of Matthew, it begins in a different way, and we will see. Pay attention to the end. Pay attention to the end. It says, Eliasar became the father of Matan, Matan the father of Jacob, Jacob the father of Joseph, the husband of Mary. Of her was born Jesus, who is called the Messiah. See, Jacob was the father of Joseph. And this means that the, the name of Joseph was Joseph bar Jacob, Joseph bar Jacob, Joseph bar Jacob, which means Joseph, son of Jacob. That was his name. But how did the angel greet him? He didn't greet him as Joseph, son of Jacob. He greeted him as Joseph, son of David. You see? He's changing his name. Why is that? Well, if we go to the beginning of this genealogy, it says, the book of the genealogy of Jesus Christ, the son of David. You see? Jesus Christ, the son of David. The angel is calling Joseph, not Joseph, son of Jacob, but rather Joseph, son of David. Just the same way he is calling Jesus. Jesus Christ, I mean, the, the evangelist. Just the same way the evangelist is calling Jesus. Jesus Christ, the son of David. So there is a common connection between David and Joseph and Jesus. And what's the connection? Well, if we read through the genealogy, we get to this point. Jesse, the father of David, the king, David became the father of Solomon. Ah, what matters here is that David was the king. David actually was the second king of Israel. The first one was Saul. And after Saul, the second king was David. And then David had a son who was Solomon, who was the third king of Israel. So when we see that Jesus Christ is the son of David, we see, we realize that Jesus is the son of the king. When the angel calls Jacob, not uh, Joseph, I mean, when the angel calls Jacob, not Joseph, son of Jacob, but rather Joseph, son of David, he's telling Joseph, Joseph, the son of the king. That is a shocking moment for Joseph because it becomes clear to him that he belongs to the royal house of David. Just imagine an angel that appears and calls you in a different way, that names you a different way. And because Joseph was a good Jew, he was even a righteous man. Of course, he knows his traditions and he knows the story and he knows the prophecies. So he knows that the Messiah is going to be born from the royal house of David. He knows that. So the angel calls Joseph son of David. So he realizes that he belongs to that royal house. And then what he is going to explain next is going to make sense to Joseph. Because Joseph knows that the Messiah will be a heir of King David. And not only this will help Joseph to understand the explanation the angel is going to give next, but also by naming him Joseph, son of David, the angel is formally giving Joseph a leading role in the salvation plan of God. You have to remember that in scripture, the name matters a lot because the name reflects the essence of a person. The, the name represents the mission of a person. That's why 
through the scripture, in different occasions, we see God himself changing the name of somebody. Like in the case of Abraham without an H, Abraham. And then his name was changed to Abhamon, Abraham, Abhamon, which means the father of the multitudes. Or think, for instance, of, uh, well, even Jesus did the same. Think of, of Simon, right? And he changed his name to Cephas because he was going to be the rock upon he would build his, his church, right? Well, remember that this same angel also changed the name of Mary because when, when, the, when, when Gabriel the archangel appeared to Mary on the Annunciation, he didn't greet her as Mary. He didn't tell her, Haire, que, Haire Mariam, Haire Mariam would be rejoice, Mary. No, he said, Haire que harito many, rejoice, full of grace. So he was naming Mary full of grace. And actually being full of grace is the essence of Mary. That's why she's the Immaculate Conception because she's full of grace. So the angel was naming her by her essence, by her true essence, not by her given name, Mary, but rather by her true essence, Keharito many, full of grace. Now he's calling Joseph. You, you see how the angel plays these kind of games? The same he did to Mary. Now he's doing the same with Joseph, Joseph, son of David. Well, let's continue. But before we continue, actually, I really want to point this out. The angel is formally giving Joseph a leading role in God's salvation plan. Because when we think of Joseph as the silent one, we are really mistaken. He was crucial to the plan of salvation. He was crucial. He was just not a silent observer. He had a leading role. And that's why the angel calls him Joseph, son of David. You belong to the house of the Messiah, to the royal house of the Messiah. So the angel tells him, do not be afraid to take Mary, your wife, into your home. For it is through the Holy Spirit that this child has been conceived in her. So now this makes sense to him because now he realizes that he belongs to the house of David. So this makes sense. It is possible if I belong to the house of David and the Messiah will be a heir of King David and Mary is my wife, then yeah, this makes sense. And the angel makes it super clear because he explains next. She will bear a son and you are to name him Jesus because he will save his people from their sins. He is giving him two instructions. Take Mary, right? And also name the, name the baby, name the child. And the way you are going to name him is Jesus. Once again, to name somebody means to assign that person a mission. And Jesus, or Joshua in Hebrew, means the Lord saves. Uh, and I don't say Yahweh saves because it is a mistake. Because the name of God is not meant to be pronounced. It is impossible to pronounce it. People have added vowels to try to pronounce it. And that's why we have came to Yahweh. But that's a mistake. It is just a name that cannot be named. So that's why... Uh, when it was translated, when the scripture in, in Hebrew was translated to Greek, it was translated as Kyrios, the Lord. So that's why I'm saying the Lord, the Lord saves, not to name a name that is not meant to be named. Why not? Well, because, again, when we name somebody, we are encompassing that person or that object even uh, on the essence of that person, right? So in the case of, uh, of, of anything, I mean, if I name this a bottle, then this is a bottle and it, it is nothing else. It is not a pencil. It is not a, a balloon. It is a bottle, right? So by naming something, we are just uh, encapsulating that object into that name. And that's why the name of God cannot be pronounced because God has a name that goes beyond. It transcends every name because he is infinite. He is eternal. He is God, right? So that's why his name cannot be pronounced. So, but in any case, Joshua means the Lord saves. And when the angel tells Joseph that he will name the child Jesus or Joshua or the Lord saves, then it is super clear to Joseph that that child is going to be the Messiah. And it makes sense now to him because he knows now that even he belongs to the house of David. And it is not that he learned this from the angel. He knew because he knew the traditions of his ancestors. 
but it is not the same when you know that when an angel comes and points this out to you, right? That completely change, changes everything forever. Then we flip the pages in the, in the Bible and we find the epiphany. And after the epiphany, we get to the third dream of Joseph. When they had departed, behold, the angel of the Lord appeared to Joseph in a dream and said, Rise, take the child and his mother, flee to Egypt and stay there until I tell you. Herod is going to search for the child to destroy him. Once again, going word by word, we find an important idea. The angel tells him, rise, take the child and his mother. When we do the, the narrative analysis of this, of this text, Something that matters, trying to find the structures and all that. Something that matters is the order in which ideas are presented. So look at here. It says, take the child and his mother. It doesn't say, take the mother and his child. It doesn't say, take your wife and the child. No, it says, take the child first and his mother second. That is deliberate. Who is more important, the mother or the child? The child. And to make it clear, then the evangelist mentions him first. That's why it matters. It matters. Take the child first and his mother next. You see? Flee to Egypt and stay there until I tell you. Why Egypt? Why did he go to Egypt? Why didn't he tell him, you know, just go back to Nazareth? Because they could have gone back to Nazareth for one reason. There is something here that says next, Herod is going to search for the child. If he went back to Nazareth, then he would be in Galilee. And Herod didn't have any jurisdiction there. He didn't have any power in Galilee. But he had power in Judea, where they were in Bethlehem. So if the angel had told them to go back to Nazareth, they would be safe from Herod. But the angel actually sends them far, far, far away to Egypt from Bethlehem. That is around 260 miles. Back then, in which they had, you know, the means of transportation were very limited. Many people actually walked those distances. And to walk, uh, the common distance to walk was 12 miles a day. Now, you can imagine walking with a woman and uh, a just born child. So probably that distance was even shorter than that. So getting from one point to the other would take them more than 20 days. It was a long trip. Have you ever wondered why he went to Egypt? Why they were sent to Egypt? That's something you have when you begin analyzing a text, you have to question everything because then you begin investigating and then you find and then you get excited because you learn. So why Egypt? Well, first of all, yeah, there was an obvious thing. It was a different jurisdiction. He was going to be far, far, far away from Herod. So he would be safe from Herod. Who? The child, of course. That was the one. He was the one who had to be, uh, uh, to be safe. But also Egypt offered stability because it was still a very rich country with plenty of opportunities because of the Nile, you know, the lands and, and everything was, uh, 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 they flourished and uh, Egypt had was a, a rich nation. So it was a good place to settle. And that's why still at that time, many people would, uh, many, many immigrants would go to Egypt and, and they would settle in there. So this is the obvious thing, but there is a more important thing, a more important reason, and it is a theological reason God wants his son to go to Egypt, not to get to Egypt, but to set him in Egypt so at some point he can leave Egypt. Because one of the things Jesus is doing is redeeming the people of Israel, right? And, by, and, and, and in order to redeem the people of Israel, Jesus is going to leave the adventures of the people of Israel and leave them in a definite way. We see this very clearly, and we saw this very clearly uh, two Sundays ago in the first Sunday in Lent, 
right? When Jesus is led to the desert to be tempted. And Jesus is tempted in the, in the desert the same way the people of Israel was tempted in the desert. And Jesus, opposite to the people of Israel, Jesus overcomes temptation. And the way he does is by quoting three times a text from the book of Deuteronomy precisely. So, so you can see Jesus as the definite son of God because the people of Israel was also the son of God. But Jesus is the definite son of God. So for that reason, he needs to go to Egypt so that he can exit Egypt in what would be the final exodus. Because the people of Israel had to go through that exodus to leave Egypt, right? So that's why. So Jesus is sent to Egypt so he can leave Egypt at some point as the definite Moses in the final exodus. And we can even see that in the book of, of, of prophet Hosea, uh, God says from Egypt, I called my son. And this prophecy is now fulfilled. Once again, remember that Matthew is written to Christians who came from the Jewish world. So he wants to convince them that this Jesus is the Messiah and, and to reassure them that once they believe, he is indeed the Messiah. So that's why he continuously brings uh, the, the, the prophecies to, to, so, so they can understand that Jesus is fulfilling them. From Egypt I called my son. And uh, tradition says that in the, in the Basilica of St. Sergius in Cairo, uh, you can find in there the house where the Holy Family lived when they were living in Egypt. And you can see the picture there. The reason to flee to, Jerusalem, to, to, to Egypt, uh, because one thing is traveling to Egypt, right? He didn't tell him, travel to Egypt. No, he said, flee to, now, flee to Egypt right away. And the reason is that Herod is going to search for the child to destroy him. Herod is going to search for the child to destroy him. Don't confuse this Herod, who is Herod the Great, with Herod Antipas, who was the one who killed John the Baptist and who was the one who judged Jesus. Remember that, that Pilate sent Jesus to Herod. That Herod was Herod Antipas. He was the, the son of Herod the Great. Herod the Great was important because one of the biggest things he did was rebuilding the temple that Solomon had built and that had been destroyed by the Babylonians. And then uh, Herod, uh, Herod, uh, with Herod, uh, they could rebuild the temple. But Herod had a very big problem. He was obsessed with his authority. And he was obsessed with the fear of somebody taking over his authority. And he was so paranoid about somebody taking over his authority that at some point he gave orders to kill two of his sons, Alexander and Aristobulus, because he was afraid that they would steal the throne from him. And if that was not enough, he had another son, Antipater, who was killed by him. He himself killed his son because he was also afraid of Antipater. So when the Magi came and told him about the baby who was born, who was going to be a king, he panics. And that's why he wants to kill Jesus. And yes, he would. Nothing would stop him when he had already killed three of his sons for that reason. So that's why he, he was obsessed and that's why he wanted to destroy Jesus because the Magi told him that he was going to be a king. And of course, the Magi went to the palace of Herod to, to ask first, right? If they were looking for the king, where, where they would ask first in the palace. That's why they went to Herod in the first place. So they spent some time in, in, uh, in Egypt. We can think that it was probably four years because, you know, that would be a, a different lecture you're trying to set the dates and the timeline but we can think that they spent about four years in uh, in Egypt and then Herod the Great died when they had departed behold the angel of the Lord appeared to Joseph in a dream and said rise take the child and his mother flee to Egypt and stay there until I tell you Herod is going to search for the child to destroy him this is the third dream this is the third dream so once again, I went through this text, through this narration, 
word by word, trying to find the structure. And finally, finally, I found something really interesting in the structure of the narration of this dream. What I found was that the structure matches the structure of the second dream. You can see the second dream on the left and the third dream on the right. In the second dream, the angel of the Lord appeared in Joseph's dreams and told him, Rise, take the child and his mother and flee to Egypt and stay there until I tell you Herod is going to search for the child to destroy him. In the third dream, the angel of the Lord appeared in Joseph's dreams in Egypt and told him, Rise, take the child and his mother and return to Israel, for those who saw the child's life are dead. You see? Isn't this fascinating? Or what? Now, of course, this was very deliberate. It was not a coincidence. Especially because when we read the narration of the other two dreams, they have a different structure. They don't even have a structure for a start. But here, it is identical. And I see somebody even taking a picture of this moment because that's something she wants to preserve forever because I know that this is, no, I mean, and, and you are doing right. Don't, don't be shy, take the picture because you know, when I discovered this here in my studio, I raised from my chair and I, began, <laughs> and I began walking back and forth because I had, I had made this, this important discovery. Of course, many Bible scholars for sure have discovered this before, but when you find it yourself, it is always very exciting. Now, the thing is that, uh, see, out of excitement, I jumped ahead many, many slides. Uh, let me go back to the right one. So we can clearly see, we can clearly see that th there is a parallel in the structure, but at the same time, we find differences. And those subtle differences are used by the evangelist to make a point. See, in the beginning, it's the same, the angel of the Lord. Or, and I actually said angel of the Lord used to be consistent with Greek. Angel of the Lord, remember, as the name. Appeared in Joseph's dreams, appeared in Joseph's dreams. And told him, rise, take the child and his mother. Again, the child first, the mother second, right? He's more important than the mother. And flee to Egypt and return to Israel. We see here something different, right? And flee to Egypt and return to Israel. But here is the best part. And this is the point the evangelist, in a very smart way, wants to establish. And stay there until I tell you Herod is going to search for the child to destroy him. In other words, to kill him. For those who saw the child's life are dead. Herod wanted to kill the child. At the end of the story, who is the one who died? The child or Herod? Herod. So this is a very elegant way of being ironic. You know who had the best laughter here? It was not Herod, because Herod was the one who ended up dying. You see? So that's why that's why the narrations are identical, but they are different at the end, just to establish that point. Just to make that point, the one who wanted to kill the child is the one who died. Which means, which means the one who prevailed was the child. It was not King Herod. The one who prevailed over King Herod was the child. This is beautiful. And this is what we call in scripture an antithetical parallel. An antithetical parallel. When they are the same, then you call them a synonymical parallel. When they are the opposite, they are antithetical parallel. You know. Now let's go to the fourth dream. But when he heard that Archelaus was ruling over Judea in place of his father Herod, he was afraid to go back there. And because he had been warned in a dream, he departed for the region of Galilee. He went and dwelt in a town called Nazareth, so that what had been spoken through the prophets might be fulfilled. He shall be called a Nazarean. So there is a change in plans, which means that Joseph, when, when he knew that he had to go back, Joseph decided to settle in Bethlehem. Perhaps you thought 
perhaps you thought that when they went back, they went back directly to Nazareth, right? But it happens that they were not heading to Nazareth. They were heading to Bethlehem. But why to Bethlehem if they were originally from Nazareth? Have you ever thought about that? Well, first of all, they were not from Nazareth. They lived in Nazareth, but they were actually from Bethlehem because Bethlehem is the house of David and they belong to the house of David. So they were from Bethlehem, even though they lived in Nazareth. And even though they lived in Nazareth, Joseph decided to settle in Bethlehem for one reason, because he is the son of David and because his son, Jesus, is also the son of David. He is the Messiah. So thinking now as a son of David, Joseph says, we are going to settle in the house of David, which happens to be Bethlehem. And that's why they were heading to Bethlehem. But because he had been warned in a dream, he departed for the region of Galilee. Why? Because he heard that Archelaus was ruling over Judea in place of his father. So this is really interesting here because he was afraid, you know, that Archelaus, being the son of Herod the Great, would also try to kill Jesus if he learned that Jesus was back. Just to fulfill the desire of his father of killing him. And because perhaps Archelaus himself would also be afraid of him as a king. That's why they go to, back to Nazareth. They decide in the end to go to Nazareth. Or Joseph decides in the end to go to Nazareth. And that's why the Holy Family in the end lived in Nazareth. But for Matthew, this is relevant because once again, he see another prophecy being fulfilled. And that's how he ends. So that what had been spoken through the prophets might be fulfilled. He shall be called a Nazorean. So that, that's what explains the change in plans. So as a review, what can we conclude if we, if we put each of the dreams next to each other? What can we find? Well, Mary bears a child. And in the first dream, the angel tells Joseph, take Mary. The consequence is that he no longer divorces him. And that's actually not a consequence. That's the way he responds to the dream. That was Joseph's answer to the dream. What happened, the dream, and how Joseph responded to the dream. This is what this slide is presenting. Then Herod wants to kill the child. The angel, through the dream, tells him, flee to Egypt. And his response is to leave immediately. Then Herod dies, and in a dream, Joseph is told to return to Israel. And his response is to return. And then they find that the son of Herod, Archelaus, is in Judea. So in the, in the dream, he's, he's told, don't go to Judea. And the way he responds to this dream is changing his destination. There is something really ironic also here, you know, because they went to Galilee to avoid Archelaus, the son of Herod the Great, right? Well, it turns out, it turns out that later on, the ruler of Galilee will be another son of Herod the Great, Herod Antipas. And when Jesus lives his public life, his public ministry, and when he, go, he will actually be his enemy. He will actually be his enemy. So it is ironic that they moved from Judea to Galilee to avoid one of the sons of Herod the Great. And later on, another son of Herod the Great is going to be Jesus' enemy. And he will even trial him, you know, at the end of his life. So, so that, that's quite, an, uh, quite, quite uh, ironic. But anyway, so the bottom line is that the way... Joseph responds to each of the dreams is by obeying. He consistently obeys, and that is a big teaching for us, right? When he hears the voice of the Lord through an angel, he obeys. It was not easy because all the different actions imply big decisions and, you know, and risks to take. And uh, first of all, 
yeah, okay, I'm going to take Mary, but the reality is that even if I take Mary, people are going to notice that she's pregnant and that we are not living together. So I don't know how we're going to explain this. It's not going to be easy. But if that's the voice of the Lord, if that's the will of the Lord, I will obey. Flee to Egypt. Flee to Egypt. The baby is just born. How am I going to go to Egypt, to a distant country? I don't even speak Egyptian. And I don't have acquaintances there. I will have to start from zero once again. Have you ever thought, I mean, to make that kind of a big trip and then to, to settle in Bethlehem, not in Bethlehem, in Egypt, and to get a home in Egypt and to begin working in Egypt, probably with a workshop, but probably he started offering his services because uh, Joseph was uh, what would nowadays be a handyman. That's what he was. So he first began offering his services and when he, when he had some money, he could probably uh, establish another workshop or, or, or open another workshop in, in Egypt. But one of the things that actually helped them to take that kind of a trip, because you can say, and, and no, that is costly. Where did they get the money to undertake that kind of an adventure? Well, remember that a few days earlier, the Magi came and brought some gifts to the child incense, mirror, and what else? Gold. So for sure, they use that gold in order to be able to go to go and, and to, to travel to Egypt and to establish themselves in, in Egypt, you see? So God provides. God provides the other and, and he helps him. But still, they were different uh, consistently. He didn't even question back. He didn't question back. He didn't ask for any explanation. He just obeyed. He just obeyed once and then because uh, that is really important because, first of all, to obey means to listen. To obey comes from the Latin obaudire. That in Latin you say, ob audire means to obey. Ob audire, ob audire, like audition with the ear. So to obey means, first of all, to, to, to listen, to listen attentively. So the way Jesus obeys is, first of all, he listens. Second of all, he embraces what he has to do. And third, or he embraces the will of God, and then he acts upon. That's the way Jesus obeys. He listens to God, he embraces his will, and he acts upon. And that is also a big teaching. Because no matter what, he acted upon it. He didn't question the will of God. He just did it. Once and again, he just did it. He listened, he embraced the will of God, and he acted upon it. A big teaching for us. And how do we know this? Because he consistently behaved the same, right? So you can see how, how different it is. I wonder if by now you have read any reflection about the silence of Joseph, and that can be fascinating, certainly. But, but when we really pay attention to what we really know about him or to, you know, when we pay attention to what the evangelist really told us about him, there is so much to learn about Joseph, so much to learn about him. I wonder if you have taken the time to read the letter that was written by Pope Francis, Patris Corde, with the heart of a father. It is a short and beautiful letter that he wrote precisely to proclaim the year of St. Joseph. You can find it, you know, in, in Google, you, you search for Patris Corde and uh, you will find it in the Vatican and then you read it. It is short, it is beautiful and it is catechetical because the Pope reflects on, 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 uh, uh, on Joseph as the loving father, as uh, the father in the shadows, as uh, uh, somebody who is uh, valiantly creative and different aspects of, of the life of Joseph according to what is written in the gospel. And of course, the Pope reflects with a pastoral uh, lens so that we can apply what we learn from Joseph. So I really recommend you to read that letter, Patris Corde. It is, it is a, a small letter, but beautiful, beautiful. I have been covering that letter for many weeks in my program in Spanish, precisely reflecting on each of the different points Pope Francis developed in there. So this is the way Joseph obeys, by listening to the will of God, by embracing the will of God, and by acting upon the will of God. So for all this, and just to conclude, 
we can see that Joseph is the son of David, which means he is a leading actor in the plan of salvation. He is not the silent observer that is always standing behind Mary. You know, it is not fair to Joseph, really. But just look at all the representations of the Holy Family, even the one in your nativity scene. And when you see Joseph, he's always standing behind Mary like this. Honestly, if we want to imitate the virtues of a saint, is it appealing to you to look like this, just like Joseph? You know, because there, there was one, one, uh, uh, one priest who was a Josephologist, and uh, he wrote a book on Joseph, and on the preface of his book, he said, it is enough of representing Joseph standing behind Mary with his eyes looking at heaven as if saying, it was not me. <laughs> That's the way he is represented. But no, but when we see who Joseph was, that he was courageous, he was loving, that he was passionate, that he immediately acted upon things, that he took chances no matter what. Yeah, that I want to be somebody like him. And especially when I realize how much he loved Mary and how much he loved Jesus. Yes, I want to be like him. That's the saint I want to be like. And that's what we can learn from Joseph through all these beautiful passages in the gospel. Joseph is not the silent observer. He is a leading actor in the plan of salvation because he is the son of David. He is the protector of the family. That is obvious. And we can see that. He flees to Egypt in order to protect his family. And then, well, even since the beginning, even since the beginning, when just imagine that moment of big anxiety, when he realized that Mary was about to give birth and he was knocking door after door and nobody would open or if they opened, they said, sorry, but we are full. There is no room here. Go to the next door. Just imagine the moment, the moment when he had to make the decision. Either the child is born here in the middle of the street or we go to a cave, even when that cave is used for the animals to sleep. And they went to the cave. And he had to use straw, whatever, just to, to, to make it possible for the baby to be there. He was protecting his family since that moment. Since that moment, he was always protecting on them. But then, based on the dreams, of course, which is what we are talking about tonight, we can see definitely how uh, he flees to Egypt to protect his family. And then when they are going back to Bethlehem, who, which was his original plan, then he decides to change his destination. What for? to protect the child and the mother. And always the child first and the mother next. But in the end, both of them. It is not one or the other. It is the child and the mother, right? And he is protecting them. And precisely because he is the protector of the family and because he's the protector of, of, of uh, Jesus himself, he's been called in the church the nutritor domine, which means the Lord's guardian. And about this, about this topic, about the Lord's Guardian, there is another letter that you must read on this year of St. Joseph, and that was written by St. John Paul II. It is called Redemptoris Custos. Redemptoris Custos. I don't remember the name in English, but Redemptoris Custos actually means the Lord's Guardian. Uh, that's what it means. It, it actually means the Redeemer's Guardian. But look for Redemptoris Custos from John Paul II. And you will learn even more. So just by reading those two letters of Pope John Paul, Redemptoris Custos, and uh, Patris Corde from, for, from Pope Francis, you will learn a lot, a lot about St. Joseph. And then you will watch the video for the second time, and then you learn even more. <laughs> Finally, we clearly see that Joseph is an obedient man who listens to the will of God, who embraces the will of God, and who acts upon the will of God. To conclude this presentation, and because this is the year of St. Joseph, and because now for sure we know Joseph a lot better than an hour ago, because if you don't know Joseph better than an hour ago, then I won't ever come back to Mary Queen of Peace. <laughs> but I know that's not the case. <laughs> I know that's not the case. And I'm sure that you learned a lot of fascinating things and, and you thought of things that you had never thought of and that's what, what makes it even exciting. But it is the year of St. Joseph. And Pope Francis on his Patris Corde, he concluded with a prayer to St. Joseph to be prayed precisely throughout 
the year of St. Joseph. So I would like all of us to finish this presentation by praying for the intercession of St. Joseph using this prayer composed by Pope Francis. And, and you can find it at the end of, of his letter, Patris Corde. And I have written it here so you can, you can also read it at home with me. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Hail, guardian of the Redeemer, spouse of the Blessed Virgin Mary. To you, God entrusted his only Son. In you, Mary placed her trust. With you, Christ became man. Blessed Joseph, to us too, show yourself a father and guide us in the path of life. Obtain for us grace, mercy, and courage, and defend us from every evil. Amen. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. So, I wonder if we still have time for questions, and if you have any questions. Okay, I see a comment here. I would like to see the map again because I am interested how after 40 days they traveled all the way back to Jerusalem for the purification presentation. You know, that is an interesting question, a very interesting question that I myself with for years and years and years and years. We have to understand two things. First, that there are two different narr narratives of the infancy and that they come from two different traditions. And you know how traditions happen. People will tell things the way they remember them, and they will tell things depending on what was more relevant to them. And what was not even relevant to them, they will forget about. Just think about what happened here tonight and everything you have learned. I am sure that if tomorrow or later tonight you tell somebody what you heard tonight, each of you is going to have a completely different version, even though you are going to tell the same, right? And some of you will make an emphasis on that parallel you even take a, took a picture of, or, you, or about the map, or about the house in, in Sergius, in, in Cairo, whatever. So there is, there is something that seems to be a discrepancy here, or, or that is hard to, to make it fit, but it has to fit some way. What happens is that Jesus is born and then he is presented to the temple 40 days after he was born, right? So if we set Christmas Day, and, and you know, this is, this is actually what makes, it what makes it complex because it has to fit, because it happened. What makes it complex is not the gospel. What makes it complex to understand is our liturgical calendar. For this reason, so Jesus is born on the 25th, just to, to, just to, to have a baseline here. Jesus is born on the 25th. And then in our liturgical calendar, on the 6th of January, the, the, three, the three wise men come on the epiphany, right? And then we jump from liturgy to the gospel, to the gospel according to Matthew. And in the gospel according to Matthew, it seems as if that same night when the Magi came, and it, it, it was not, I mean, it didn't have to be a night. Most likely it happened through the day. I mean, who, who's going to go in the middle of the night to knock on a door to visit a, a, boy, a, a baby who was just born, right? Out of courtesy, you do, that, you do that kind of visits during the day. But because we tend to think of it as, as everything happening, even in the night of Christmas, you know, we tend to imagine that the Magi came on a night and then on, on because they were following the star, so that, that was on a night, right? And then he went to the palace of Herod and, and knocked. And the, it was as if during the middle of the night, Herod would call for the for the historians and for the theologians and for all the, 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 the scholars to know about that. And then the Magi on that same night following the star went to Bethlehem. And on that same night, once they found where Jesus was, okay, so Jesus is born on the 25th of December. And then on the 6th, we have the epiphany. And then because we jump from liturgy to the gospel, then we know or we think that that same night they fled to Egypt. But then 40 days after the 25th of December, 
which is what, February 2nd, right? On February 2nd, then they have to present him to the temple because he was the firstborn and firstborns had to be presented to the temple 40 days after they were born. So how is it possible? And that's why somebody is challenging me to show the map because how can it be possible to travel such a distance in order to be at the temple of Jerusalem in 40 days, right? Well, if we disconnect the liturgical calendar from the gospels, then everything has to match. But it has to match following the logical order of events. So once the baby was born, everything seems to indicate that they didn't go back to, to Nazareth yet. They spent some time in Bethlehem. Do we know that the Magi came and found him in Bethlehem? Because uh, that was another prophecy that had to be fulfilled also. So the most logical thing to happen is that once the baby was born on the cave, you know what Joseph did next day? He went to find a room for sure until he finally found where to stay or where to move because he was not going to, to have the baby in the manger for days and days just as we have in our nativity scenes at home. You know That is obvious. He had to find a place. So they moved to a place. They stay in Bethlehem which was very close to Nazareth. It was very close to, uh, to, to Jerusalem. Bethlehem was very close to Jerusalem. So they had to, to be there waiting for the time, for the 40 days in order to go to, to Jerusalem because it was very close. So then the epiphany had to happen after those 40 days. After those 40 days. Because on that night, they had to flee. You know, that's the only way to make everything fit. If you read the gospel, both Luke and Matthew, you will find no dates. You will find no times. You won't find how many days. The only count you can know of is the 40 days after the birth. In, you know, when they went to the temple. Other than that, there is no reference or there is no timeline whatsoever. Besides, the presentation to the temple is Refuk, whereas the Epiphany and the flee to Egypt is referred by Matthew, different traditions. And Matthew doesn't mention the presentation at the temple, just as Luke does mention the flee to Egypt. So when you combine what Matthew says with what Luke says, and you, and you connect every event in a logical timeline, then what... what but should Tiffany actually occurred after the 40 days. And then and only then they could go to Egypt without having to go back. Because otherwise, why going to Jerusalem? It would have been super risky because now Herod was after him. You see? I, I'm so grateful do you still, for do you you still need to explain to that. Because you know what else I noticed mm -hmm. is that um, Herod uh -huh. killed all the babies two years and younger. So that yes. kind of gives an answer too, doesn't it? That right. they would have been there, you know, maybe up to two years. Thank you so much for explaining. I really have appreciated everything you've shared tonight. Thank you. Sure. Do you still need to see the map or, or not anymore? No, it's okay. 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 Yeah. Yeah. But, you know, I struggled with the same for years and years and years. So but <laughs> that's the way to disconnect liturgy, the liturgical calendar from the Gospels, and then everything will make sense, you know? Which doesn't mean the liturgical calendar is wrong. In the liturgical calendar, calendar we just celebrate what happened, you know. <laughs> anyway, I have a comment, uh, just a quick comment. Um, uh -huh. If um, you know, if you look at the uh, the flight into Egypt, you know, one thing that strikes me is the irony that um, Israel is rescued from Egypt by God, taken into the Promised Land where they establish a kingdom. Uh -huh. But now the Messiah has to flee to Egypt to get away from the king. Um, so, so that land, that the whole exodus is all about bringing you out of Egypt to save you. And now the Messiah has to hide in Egypt for protection from the authorities of his own people. That, that's just so, so full of irony, I think. Yes, it is. It is in a way it is. But in the end, that is with the final purpose of Jesus performing the final exodus from Egypt 
finally leaving, leaving, leaving uh, Egypt as the son of God with a capital letter S, you know. Mm -hmm. And in order to, to leave Egypt, he has to go to Egypt first. <laughs> so that's why, and that's why he was sent to Egypt and not to Nazareth, where he would also be safe. Yeah. Thank you so much. Thank you. Sure, Sultan. Well, you know, this was very, very exciting to me, uh, not only doing the exercise of, of uh, analyzing all these texts and putting the presentation together, but every time I share this, uh, I get excited because it is exciting. I mean, it is really, really exciting. And yeah, it helps us to learn a lot more about Joseph. And on this year, I think it was a great idea of Pope Francis, because if not, for sure, we wouldn't take the time to, I mean, I cannot speak for everybody, but certainly not for myself. You know, I'm I, working on evangelization for years and years and years, and this is the first time I really focus on St. Joseph. So I am grateful to Pope Francis for that brilliant idea. I think everything was so clear, Mauricio. I hope so. Thank you. <laughs> yes, thank you. Thank you so much. Yeah, thank you for thank you for yeah, joining. Thank you very much, Mauricio. Thank you. Thank you. My pleasure. Thank you. Have a good thank night. You, thank you. All right. Perfect. So just, just remember that this session is going to, is recorded, so we can share it with other people. So I'm going to upload it in the MakeUP website, so you can share it with other people. That's okay. okay. Yes. Yeah, great. Perfect. Thank you, Monica. Thank you, Monica. Thank you. And no, God bless you all. Thank you for joining us tonight, and have a wonderful night.